Well, let's go ahead and get started this beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Steve Modernock. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Food and Drug Officials. And we're very pleased to be partnering with uh, AIB International on this series of webinars. This is webinar number, webinar number three of four. If you've missed any of the webinars, uh, uh, we do have them all available on YouTube. And uh, after this webinar, you'll get an email link that includes uh, the recording to this along with the other webinars. So if you didn't get to see them all, we encourage you to take a look. Uh, I will tell you they are all uh, very good and we have a fantastic speaker with us for this series. Uh, once again, we're pleased to welcome uh, Judy Lazaro, who is the Senior Director for Food Safety uh, at AIB International. She has held many different roles in the food industry, everything from food inspector to head of audit services in North America. Uh, she also has worked in a lot of the, the biggest food companies of the, of the U.S., including Frito-Lay and others. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Judy's bio today because she told me not even to introduce her, but we'll go ahead and get started this afternoon. Before we get started, if you do have questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A window, um, or, and we will be getting to those uh, as we get into the presentation. Once again, put any questions on the Q&A window. And uh, one last thing, our final webinar will be coming up in about another uh, 10 days, if I recall correctly. That is going to be on Monday, April 12th, and it will be at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. So uh, we have one more webinar in this series, and that will be Monday, April 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be focusing on packaging for manufacturers. Uh, so once again, let's welcome Judy and get started, and uh, we look forward to her presentation and to your questions. Welcome, Judy. Thank you again, Steve, and thanks always to AFTO. Amy, thanks for setting these up. Great team at AFTO, and, and again, this is a great opportunity. Uh, it, is, it is Good Friday, and I wish everybody a wonderful weekend, a happy Easter. If I forget to say that, let me just say that now. Um, we are going to get started. It, it is a Friday afternoon. I know you all want to have a webinar and then be on with your day, so we will get started. We're going to start real quickly with the mission statement at AIB International. If you don't know much about AIB, International. We're a hundred year old company, actually over a hundred years now, started in 1919. And all we do is service the food industry. It's all we do. We service the food industry. So think of us as your branch office. I mean, really, we're, we're your branch office for food safety, for example. Um, what I want you to pay attention to is the second bullet point. It says equipping our clients with knowledge. So our mission statement is to positively impact food, the food supply chain by promoting food integrity, but equipping our our clients with knowledge. And that's really what I hope we're going to do in this short time that we have together. I hope you'll learn something. I hope I can teach you something. And then, of course, just like all of you, we want to support the delivery of safe, high quality food every day. We are going to talk first about our consolidated standards because the information that I'm going to share with you today comes directly from our consolidated standards. And these are a free download. You can get these absolutely for free on our website or send me an email and I'll put them right in your mailbox. Um, but the information in here, you know, this is taking the good manufacturing practices and making them more prescriptive. I mean, that's really what our consolidated standards, uh, what they are. We look at the global, the global food safety, you know, global food, food safety, take industry best practices and put them in this booklet. So it really is what I call a ready reference. Every food company should have a co copy of the consolidated standard. And there is one specifically for beverage facilities and you see the cover on the screen. So let's start with this, okay, because our consolidated standard focuses on product zone, because what do we do when, you know, you have a, if I've told you you have an inspector in the lobby right now, what do you do? You start cleaning, you clean, you clean, you clean, you clean, you sweep the floor, you sweep the floor, you sweep the floor. And you, you go after you panic, because everybody goes into like a little panic mode, like, oh my gosh, what are they here for, right? What I want you to do is focus on the product zone. Find the product zone. And you've already had a second to look at this slide while I've been talking. And what do you see? If, it, if you had that inspector in the lobby, what do you see? What are you gonna fix first? And what you wanna fix first is product zone. 
But what we really pay attention to often is what doesn't look pretty to us, what doesn't look good. And what I want you to do is change your thinking, focus on the product zone. Where is my product zone in this picture? And if I take a second, I will find it. The product zone is going to be this pump and then it's going to be this hose laying on the floor. And you can see if I follow the product zone, product again travels through this pump, comes through this hose. And there it is laying directly on the floor uncapped. So that is a far greater risk to the product than it leaking orange juice or whatever juice that is onto the floor. So again, it's training ourselves to pay attention to product zone and not just everything else that, that might clutter the environment. Now, I'm not saying it's okay to have a pump that's leaking on the floor. Please don't walk away and say, Judy said, I heard AIB say it's okay, we can do that. It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is prioritize your risk. So it's the same thing. Judy's not saying don't sweep the floor. You know, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is make sure your product zone is safe. Then worry about the product area, which might be the floor. Okay. So what I want to do is I'm looking at the top five issues that we have seen in the United States with on the AIB inspection specific to the beverage world. So let's take a look at them. And, and again, I think you can walk away from this and the slides will be available to you, but I think you'll walk away. Use these slides as a training tool for your facility. Train and educate your workforce. So equipment and utensils needs to be cleanable. You have to have smooth seams, non-corrosive, and free of defects. It sounds simple, right? But here's a picture right out of a beverage plant, and you can see the very deteriorated gasket and ask yourself, is this free of defects? Is it easy, is it easy to clean? Okay. Do you have, are you checking the inside of the, the pipes? The, the plumbing, so to speak, at your facility? Are you looking inside the product zone or you're only looking at the outside of the equipment? So again, get in the habit of doing internal inspections, look inside of the equipment, look inside of the product zone. This particular picture is not from a beverage plant. It's actually from a snack food company, but I think it really illustrates what we mean when we say smooth seams. Because do you think this is smooth, easy to clean? Absolutely not. In fact, I would caution somebody to, if they were cleaning this with a, with a cleaning rag, they would be leaving pieces of the cleaning rag behind. I mean, that's how rough this surface is. So, you know, I caution you when you see things like this, you need to train your people that are doing sanitation, whether it's your sanitation staff or whether it's your quality staff that might be doing swabbing, for example, or your production people that are seeing this equipment. But somebody needs to report this, okay? Don't rely on a preventive maintenance program that may look at this piece of equipment once a month, for example. Who's more likely going to find something like this, the preventive maintenance team or, or the operator that sees it every single day? So please make sure you're encouraging your people if they see something to say something. And I also encourage when you want to really challenge, like, do you have smooth seams? Are the surfaces cleanable? Take the time to when you see equipment like this in your facility, Take the time to stop, go over and start looking at it. Because now that we've already stopped on this picture and we're looking at it, there's a whole lot of things you're seeing wrong in this picture. Whole lot of things wrong. You can see some boots. You can see a hose with some mold on it. You can also see a lot of equipment that, you know, it, it, it's previously been cleaned. I mean, the plant is telling us we've already cleaned this equipment. It's ready to go. That's the time you want to do a good self-inspection, pick it up and look at the interior of this equipment and make sure it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And that is it's going to run product and it's not going to be difficult to clean and it's free of defects. How about pest activity shows up as the next second top finding that we find in the United States? And you're thinking, really pest activity? Really pest activity. And this isn't just the facility not being tightly sealed because oftentimes we find doors open. This is actually finding pests inside of the facility or finding issues on the outside of the facility with things such as damaged bait stations, those bait stations that you keep on the outside of the facility that contain rodenticide, we often find those damaged. 
So when we talk about identified pest activity, it's not just inside, it's also outside. And what are the common pests we see? This guy, okay? For one, we see a lot of rodents and sad to admit, we don't often find the rodents. What we often find are the rodent droppings. So here's a little piece of information for you. How do you know in your facility, if you find rodent droppings, how do you know they're rodent droppings and not lizard droppings or cockroach droppings? Because believe it or not, if you put them all next to each other, they're very, very, very hard to tell the difference. They're almost identical. Add to it a little bit of dirt and dust and it's virtually impossible to tell the difference between a mouse dropping and a lizard dropping or a cockroach dropping. Does that make a difference for you in your facility? It should, because you don't want to chase after a mouse when in fact you have a, a cockroach problem. You don't want to also put a lot of mouse traps down if what your primary pest is, is maybe a lizard. So how do you tell the difference? Remember rodent droppings will always contain hair. So you just pick it up, break it apart. You can identify it. If there's hair, you have a rodent dropping, okay? That's what we do on our inspections. So that's why I can confidently tell you that rodents are a common issue, our second common finding in beverage plants right here. We also find a lot of these pests. Picture in the upper left is a fruit fly. Picture on the upper right is what's called a drain fly or a sewage fly or a moth fly. And then the picture on the bottom is the American cockroach. And these are also very common pests in the beverage industry. So now who's more likely going to find these pests in your facility? The pest control company that comes in maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, or your employees. And I always tell people, if you have 200 employees at your facility, you have 200 pest control operators. If you have 300, you have 300 pest control operators. And what I mean by that is your employees are the, best, the first line of defense when it comes to good pest control. One, they're the ones that need to keep the doors closed, keep the facility tightly sealed. And two, they're the ones that are going to see something. And again, if they see it, they need to say it. So, you know, again, you talk about rodents. They're nocturnal, right? They come out at night. I mean, they they come out, you'll see them, you know, if you see them during the day, that means you really have a problem because that means there's a lot of pest pressure. So again, it's typically going to be that second shift employee, that third shift employee that's going to see something run under a pallet something run behind the stored pallets, you know, you're going to, it's that operator that's going to notice something. He or she may not know what it is. They're going to say, I saw something. I don't know what it was. I saw something went really fast underneath the, the pallet. And they, and if they're close to it, it's really big. So if they're, you know, if they're close to it, they say the thing was huge. It's really, really big. But if they're far away, it was just this little thing I saw run under, underneath the pallet. What you want them to do is report it say something. You want them to put it somewhere, write it down somewhere so somebody knows about it. And we recommend this. It's a pest sighting log. So ask your pest control company to make sure they're giving you a pest sighting log. But I bet here's the thing. I bet you already have one at your facility. In fact, I bet all of you that are being inspected by, say, AIB International, or if you're doing a BRC audit or an FSSC audit, et cetera, et cetera, you already have one of these, okay? Because we require all of these on these audits. So where is it? That's your next question. Where are you keeping your pest sighting log? If you don't know where it is, it's not providing you what it's intended to provide you. And that's value. It should really be valuable. So remember, find your pest sighting log, make it accessible for people. If you need help finding them, I can help you. I just get different ones from pest control companies. I can search the internet and find them for you. But please make sure you're using a pest sighting log. It's probably the most effective tool that you can use other than a great pest control professional. Self-inspections makes the list of one of the top missed items. Now, when we say it's a top missed item, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're simply not doing self-inspections because you may be doing self-inspections. It generally means you're not doing them well. So you might be doing self-inspections, but if all you're doing, for example, is just walking through the facility and keeping your eyes at eye level and you're saying, everything looks good, everything looks good, everything looks good, that is not an effective self-inspection. So just keep this in mind when you do a self-inspection. You want to be better tomorrow than you are today. You always want to be better. So it doesn't mean that you want to just go out there and find the fewest things. You want to go out there and find the product zone. 
Remember, find the product zone, the area the product touches and anything that's up above it is your product zone. Find your product zone, inspect that area. And then if you don't find any issues in your product zone, then you can focus on the product area. And that's the area around the product zone. But make sure that you're using a flashlight. I mean, make sure that you really have a good source of light. Make sure you're also with everything that you find, make sure that you have corrective action and that you're doing root cause analysis. And at AIB, we train our auditors with a simple concept. It's called ICE, identify, control, and eliminate. And the easiest part is identifying it. It's easy to find something wrong in a plant, isn't it? I mean, think about it. It's easy to go out there and say, you know, there's a roof leak. I mean, that's easy to do. It's almost as easy to control it. You know what? Put a tarp up, put a bucket under the roof leak, move the product away. All right. The hard part is really what we leave you with, what an inspector leaves you with when they leave the facility. And that is the E, eliminate it. And that takes root cause analysis. I mean, you really have to figure out the source of, of the problem. So make sure when you're doing good self-inspections that you're, you're doing the identify, the control, and the eliminate. The other thing that we forget to do when we do a self-inspection, we forget to educate our employees. And I don't mean just train our employees. Training is just repetitively saying it over and over again till it kind of sticks in. You know, like I train my dog, tell her to sit, tell her to sit, tell her to sit. And amazingly, after about 42 attempts, she'll sit down and she gets a treat for that. I reward that great behavior, right? But when I'm not looking, do I think she's doing what I ask her to do? Absolutely not. Because I've trained her. I haven't educated her. People are educated. Dogs are trained, okay? So make sure you're educating your workforce. Really educate them. And what I mean by that is explain the why. So you know what? We don't want a roof leak in the facility. And here's the reason why. We're going to move the product away. And here's the reason why. We're going to put up a tarp right now, but that's only a temporary repair because here's what we're really going to do. And here's the reason why. Again, if you take the time to explain the why, it's going to stick, other than just repetitively teaching people, which doesn't always stick, okay? Make sure you're, you're educating your people to look up ceilings and overheads, ceilings and overheads. When we talk about, again, the product zone, the product zone is what the product touches and whatever's above it. And we tend to do a good job of this eye level inspecting. When we start looking up and it's not just ceilings, it's ceilings and overheads. So you, this is not, this is not a ceiling, but it's over the product that's underneath it. And you can see there's a lot of loose flaking paint and what would be underneath this are bottles, open bottles. Okay, so this is something that you want to encourage your people to look up, see this and say something about it. They might also look way up at the ceiling and also see more loose peeling and flaking paint. Or they may see evidence of what looks like some condensation or some water leak, or they may look up and see an, an opening to the exterior roof. They may see that. So what you want to do is encourage them to take the time, find the product zone, area the product touches, and then look above it and make sure everything above it is free of defects, is clean, that there's nothing falling back. Okay, hugely important. And then one section of our standard is called cross-contamination. And these are putting systems in place to reduce potential physical, chemical, and microbiological contamination risks. A system, an example might be a strainer. So here's the strainer in this. This is a strainer that you probably see in your beverage facility and many different locations. What's wrong with this picture? If you take a look at this picture for more than a second, you'll notice it. So one thing you want to ask your employees, especially the employees that have any responsibility for checking a strainer. So maybe somebody in the batch room and part of their shift during their shift, they have to pull a strainer and check it. One thing that you want to ask them is what side does the product, what is the good side of the strainer and what's the bad side of the strainer, if that makes sense? Where is the foreign material supposed to be and where's the foreign material not supposed to be? Because not every strainer strainer operates exactly the same way depending on how it seats some of the product might go in and then out some of it might go out and then in so what you want to do is make sure the person that's checking that strainer understands how it works then if you look at this picture 
What do you see wrong? Well, you see product on the inside of the strainer, but then you also can see product on the outside of the strainer. So even if the inside was the dirty side, the outside is also showing foreign material, which tells me if I'm glancing at this strainer, it probably hasn't been checked in whatever frequency you intended it to be checked because you're seeing a lot of foreign material or you have a system, something wrong in the facility because there is a tremendous amount of foreign material in that strainer if it's recently been checked. Now let's look closely. This is actually a spray ball. And if you look really close, you can see a piece of wire, a piece of the metal coming off of the spray ball. So again, you need to pay attention to what's going on. Is that a possible physical contaminant? You bet it is. And now again, we're looking inside of a piece of equipment. We're looking inside of the, again, what I call the plumbing. And you can notice in the bottom part of your screen, there's a piece of what looks like string, or maybe it's a piece of a gasket material. But once again, it's foreign material in the product zone. So make sure, remember, rely on your self-inspections. Really rely on your self-inspections to pay attention to what's going on inside the product zone. So look internally. Remember, look internally, find the product zone. And remember, a self-inspection is a great way to be proactive, just like a preventive maintenance program, just like a master cleaning schedule. The idea is to be proactive, get ahead of it before it's dirty, get ahead of it before it's broken. I mean, that's why we have proactive programs in place. So rely on your self-inspection program for that reason. Make sure it's a proactive, positive program. And then also use the pest sighting log. I know I talked about it and I'm going to talk about it again. Really use that pest sighting log because once again, it's a proactive step. It's a proactive measure. You know, a couple of weeks ago when we did this session, I shared a, an example and I had one company call and ask me some more details of it. So there's a particular company that they use a pest sighting log and they've used it better than anybody I've seen. And what they do, they're a large company. And what they do is they encourage their employees to write things down. And I don't mean they just say, you know, yeah, yeah, write things down. I mean, they encourage it. They really rally around the pest sighting log. And so much so that they put an incentive. So if you write something down, maybe, you know, you find something, then you might get a gas card for $5. You might get a gift card for a free cup of coffee. You might get a scratch lottery ticket. I mean, they have all these little incentives. And what they're trying to do is they're encouraging people to come forward when they find something wrong in the facility. And they do it with the pest sighting log. I think you should think about doing that for everything that relates to food safety in your facility. Encourage people to report it if something is not right. And then remember, empower, engage, train. I like the word educate. Educate the workforce at all levels of the organization. And use this training deck that we just went through. Use this training deck to train, train your folks. Now, we're not done because I know everybody likes pictures. We're going to have a little bit of fun on a Friday, but then we'll let everybody have a little bit of a Friday afternoon. What's wrong with the picture? And I'm gonna share with you a series of pictures that are actually taken from beverage facilities. And if they're not, I'll tell you uh, where they're from or the type of industry they're from. But let's take a look at them and talk about what's the issue. What do you think is wrong with this picture? It's a temporary repair, right? So is, it, uh, is AIB saying you can never make a temporary repair in a facility? Absolutely not. You absolutely can make a temporary repair. There are going to be times when you need to make a, a repair on a Tuesday because you're not going to shut the line down till Friday or Saturday. So you need to do something very, very quick. So what we expect you to have is what's called a temporary repair policy. So maybe when you make a temporary repair, you use tape like this, but you put a date on it. So it's an indication that it's temporary. Or you write down remove by April 7th. Okay, some indication that this is a temporary repair. You also don't want to make a temporary repair that is in the product zone. So a repair can be made as long as it doesn't impact the product zone. So again, what's the best thing to do? Have a temporary repair policy. And as always, if you need help with such a policy, reach out over here. We'll see what we can find for you. How about this ceiling? Because now we're looking up. We're in a cold storage room and we're looking up and we're seeing what is clearly rust on the ceiling. What is rust an indication of? 
moisture, right? So, so what, what is that telling us? It's telling us we have a vapor leak in that ceiling. We have a roof leak in that ceiling, but something is wrong. Something is wrong. Now, maybe it's 10 years old and we fixed it and everybody in the facility knows it's been fixed and it's repaired, or maybe it's brand new and it's leaking today. Whatever it is, it's worth investigating unless you know that it's 10 years old. So if I'm going in there to do an inspection, first thing I'm going to do when I see that is I'm going to read the ground. I'm going to look first down on the floor and see if anything's dripping. And then I'm going to get up on a ladder and I'm going to make sure that it's old. It's evidence of. And if you have something like that, that's evidence of, remember the E, identify, control, and eliminate. Eliminate the evidence of. It's great that you stopped the leak, but now let's get rid of the evidence. How about this picture? Peeling paint. It's something that, and this is a peeling paint on a wall. This is something that we... We, it's not uncommon to see it. And when the mistake that a lot of us make is we don't do that root cause analysis. We see this peeling paint and we scrape it and we paint it again without taking the time to say, I wonder how come it didn't stick the first time. Because if it didn't stick the first time or it's falling off the wall the first time, it's probably not going to stick the second time or it's going to fall off the wall the second time. So you need to figure out, is it coming off the wall because I've applied it wrong? Is it coming off the wall because when I do cleaning, I use a high pressure gun or high pressure hose and I blast it on the wall? Is it something I'm doing that's causing this to peel and chip? Or is it application? Or is it the wrong type of paint? What is the reason why you're seeing this loose peeling paint? So before you just scrape it down and decide to repaint it, do that root cause analysis. Otherwise, it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You're always going to be painting. You're always going to be painting. You're always going to be painting. This is actually not a beverage facility. But what's wrong with this picture? If you were just looking at this picture, what's wrong with it? Well, we talked a little bit about the facility having pests. It's always one of the top issues, identified pest activity. Well, here's a door that's propped open with a mousetrap. So not only is the door propped ajar, but I think they're just taunting me by putting a mousetrap in there like, ha, ah, we'll show you. Okay. So again, especially this time of the year when the seasons change, who doesn't want to say it's beautiful outside right now? I mean, the weather is getting better. We're starting to move into spring. This is where you want to have, really, they're going to be pretty soon. They'll be cutting grass. We all want to smell it. We want the beautiful outdoors. So let's open all the doors and windows so we can bring in that air. Absolutely not. Open those doors and windows only if you have screened inserts, okay? You don't want to keep doors open, even though it's nice outside. And this is the time of year, believe it or not, we do see an increase, a spike in rodent activity at this time of the year. And a large part of that is because we don't do a very good job of keeping the facility closed. But now this is why we have to do ice. We have to do root cause analysis. I can fix this problem. I've identified this problem. There's a mousetrap in the door. I can control it by pulling it out of the door and setting it right in place, right where it was. Do you think I've eliminated the problem? I did for about an afternoon because you know what? Tomorrow they're going to have to prop that door again for whatever reason, and they're going to do it exactly the same way. So what I need to step back and say, maybe I need to put a guard over the mousetrap so it's not so easily accessible where I can just kick it with my feet. Maybe I need to move it a couple of feet to the right or the left. I mean, maybe I need to anchor it in place. Maybe I need to do something differently, truly, so I can eliminate the problem. So that's why you have to go through the process of the root cause analysis, really solve the problem. And here's some strainers, very common in your, in your industry, very common in your plants. The ones on the left are what you want to see. They're nice, they're clean, they're in good condition. The ones on the right, not so much. You can see the one up on the top. You can see the loose wires, which will become a contaminant. And then you can see the one on the bottom that looks like somebody over years have, you know, it's just been, it's just been badly beat up. And you can say there's no structure to it at all. And you can see there's different size diameter openings now. So again, make sure you're truly looking at the strainers in your facility. And I mean, looking at them, don't just pull them out and say, yeah, it looks clean, put it back in. And the reason why you see the one on the upper right-hand corner, why that's so badly damaged is because it has a screen 
that sits inside of the housing and the screen is just a quarter of an inch longer than the housing, which means every time they slide that strainer in, they're crushing it. Every time they pull it out and check it, every time they slide it back in, they're crushing it. And again, what happens is they're getting all that loose wire at the very end, which will become a contaminant right into your product zone. And then if you have strainers, make sure you're checking them. And you can see this one here has all sorts of things in there. So please make sure you're checking strainers. Strainers are something that when you look at this picture, for example, I often ask people, I say, why do you put a strainer in? Does it make your product taste better? And they go, no, don't do that, Judy. And I say, well, does it extend the shelf life? No, doesn't do that. And I say, well, what's it do? And they say, well, it protects the product. It's for, for, it's for foreign material protection, protects the product. So if you know you're putting it in place because it's a food safety device, absolutely positively check it when you do your food safety inspection. And I bet a lot of you, when you do your self-inspections, never think to check a strainer. And, and don't you personally do it unless you're the one that does it now. Ask the operator to show you how he or she checks a strainer. And let's not forget, we have a lot of sight glasses in the beverage industry, a lot of equipment sight glasses. And you don't wanna see one that gets in this type of condition. So make sure you have a glass and brittle plastic policy. Make sure that you have considered all of the glass and the sight glasses, because you don't wanna see something like this, because this will only end up in a bad way. There's, this, is only, this can never end well when you have a condition that looks like this. And then remember when you don't forget processes, when we bring a tanker in to offload, let's say this is a tanker of corn syrup or something, let's just make up something juice. We wanna vent that tanker before we offload it, otherwise it'll crush. So we have to vent it. But when you vent it, you don't wanna just pop the tops without putting you know, a filter in there because you don't want the exterior debris, all the, that beautiful you know, spring weather to find its way inside of the tank. So how we vent it is with something like like this. The problem is this is not being maintained. So here's a tanker of high fructose corn syrup that came to this beverage plant and they have no place to store the filter so it's on a catwalk, a walking surface, which is exactly where you don't want it because we're going to pick this up and put it in the product zone, which is on top of the tanker. The other thing is if you look closely, you're noticing that there's some mold on the edges. So it's clearly not being maintained. OK, now you do the identify, the control and the eliminate, you identify it. Yep, it's dirty. Control it. Yep, we're going to pick it up, get it off the catwalk. But now here's the tough part. Where do you want the employees to put it? So you got to give them a solution because, yep, while you're standing there, they're going to hold it in their hand. But as soon as you leave, there's no place for them to put it. So make sure you give them some place where they can put the, this equipment because they are absolutely going to need it on the outside if they're receiving things in, in bulk, bulk tankers. And how about this picture? So this again is a high fructose corn syrup line and it's uncapped and it's been sitting outside and you can see that it's brought you know, the, the neighborhood, the bee collection over to it. And what's going to happen here is the employees are going to take it upon themselves to bring household pesticides. They're going to bring wasp spray to work. And how do I know that? Because we find so many cans of unrestricted, of, you know, this wasp spray that you buy, buy at your local hardware store. When we do these beverage plant inspections, we find these outdoors. And we know the reason why. It's because of the, uh, the high fructose corn syrup. It spills. And in this case, even if you clean this and put a cap on it, do you think you've solved the problem? Probably not, because look at the gravel where this is. So if you had a little bit of corn syrup that leaked on the ground, do you think you could you could clean it? Do you think you could effectively clean it? Absolutely not. So maybe the solution out here, the E for identify, control, and eliminate, is maybe it's to have, maybe it's a stainless steel catch pan, or maybe it's a concrete pad. But the solution isn't just let's clean it and put, put the cap back on it. That'll give you, that's identifying and controlling, but you haven't eliminated the B problem, okay? This is a hard picture to see, but if you look closely at it, you'll notice on the left-hand side of the spray ball, you'll see a piece of rubber, a piece of gasket sticking out of the spray ball. And this is important that you wanna train and educate your employees to, to 
pay attention to the condition of spray balls. I mean, these should be routinely removed for cleaning, but they should always be inspected. You want to be able to see that these. And the reason why is if you have a piece of uh, gasket like this or any kind of foreign material, you don't want it in a spray ball. Remember, these are not strainers. That's not what they're intended to be as a strainer. But the other thing is, remember how the CIP system works in your beverage tank, all right? Each one of these holes serves as a function. I mean, that's how you effectively clean the tank. So if you have a piece of debris that's blocking one of the openings, you're not effectively cleaning the tank as you expect to be doing. So real opportunity when you see something like that. Now we're looking inside of a batch tank. And you know, you open these batch tanks, sometimes there's strings on the top of them. And what happens if you're not doing a good job of opening them and then you dump in the, dump in the um, batch in, you're sending a whole bunch of these strings inside of the tank. And what happens over a period of time, if you're not paying attention and you're not doing good cleaning and you're not doing good self-inspections, you're gonna have an agitator that looks like this. OK, now there is a second part to this story, and I actually have a lot of familiarity with this particular company because I was the one doing the inspection this day. And when we actually opened this up and went and pulled the debris out, one of the things that we pulled out of all this debris was a mop string, a mop string. So you can do your own guessing on how a mop string got inside of the tank. And then let's look closely here and you can see that now we're looking over above. So our bottles are underneath and you're, we're looking up above and you can see there's loose peeling paint. You can also see it looks like it's a wet, you know, looks probably dark and wet. And what likes an area like this? Cockroaches. So here's another angle in the same picture, except now we're looking at another angle and look at the very center of this picture. And what do you see looking back at you? That's right. So you have to pay attention to areas like this. And that's why you need a flashlight when you do your self inspections. If you're not using a flashlight, you wouldn't have ever seen this, the uh, cockroach in the picture. Okay. And then the last picture that I want to share with you today is something that is so common. This is absolutely not a beverage plant. This is actually a, a bakery, but it is a picture that I see in so many beverage facilities. And this was just a good example of it. And it is a hose laying on the floor. And why has that become important? Think of where that hose is going to go. Think of where the nozzle of that hose is going to go. It's going to, we're going to use it inside of a tank to rinse something down. We're going to use it above a tank to rinse something down. We're going to use it near or over or in a product zone. So you never want it touching the floor. You never want to see it sitting directly on the floor. So again, pay attention to things like this. We get in the habit. I know the industry, the beverage industry is so fast moving. It, it, it is so fast. Everything goes fast. Everything goes at lightning speed. Sometimes we all need to slow down a little bit and say, okay, what's going on around me? Let me just turn my hat on as a food safety inspector today for five minutes. If you just took five minutes out of your day and, and just what, for five minutes became a food safety inspector, what are you going to see at your facility? And I want you to start doing that. And I want all your employees to get in the habit of doing that. And if you can get everybody in your facility to do self-inspections like that, I guarantee you'll be the best food safety program the beverage industry has ever seen. Okay. That's all I had for you today. Thank you very much. Whatever, what questions can I answer for you? Steve, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Sorry, Judy, I was on mute. <laughs> Doing a great job of staying on mute. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you now. Oh, I apologize. That's so, all right. You had a whole conversation with yourself, didn't you? I do it all the I, time. <laughs> uh, I did. Well, thank you for noticing. But uh, our first question in the chat box uh, was, um, we had the picture with the partially open door with rodent access highlighted. What about overhead lights above the door and the risk associated with night flying insects? Uh, reco relocation of a light source, is that required? Or what's your thoughts on something like that? 
That's a great question. So, you know, insects are attracted to lights. Flying insects are attracted to light, right? So what do we do? We take the brightest light we can find, right? And we hang it right above the personnel door. And that's what we do, right? I mean, think about it. That is what we do. So and what we're doing is we're attracting all those flying insects to right above the personnel door that we're going to open. So it, ideally, it, you know, if I were building a plant, I would always move my light so it's away from the door and I'm, I'm illuminating the door. So I'm putting the light away from the door and the light beam is coming to the door. But let's say I can't do that. Let's say, well, Judy, that's great if we're building a plan or remodeling. We don't have that kind of money. You know what you can do inexpensive, short term? Instead of the brightest white light, try putting a yellow light. Try and put a, a light up there, but you just change the color a little bit because they're less attracted to a, a yellow light, for example. So there are some inexpensive fixes out there, but the perfect solution put the light so that it's away from the door and the beam is flashing up to the door. It's a great question. Once again, a reminder to all the participants, if you do have a question, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A box. Um, Judy, you highlighted some of the most common issues in the beverage industry today. Um, if you could give the beverage industry uh, a, a couple short tips on what you would, with your experience, what might you suggest uh, as some early tips for folks in the industry? Yeah, I would. I really cannot stress enough self inspections, and I'm glad it showed up as a as a top issue. You know, we did this session a couple of weeks ago for for just the food industry in general, and self inspections was not in the top five. If I remember, it was number six or seven, and and we had an audience member that actually challenged that and said, "I you know I think self inspections should be, or were they not? They were surprised, and I I, I happen to agree with that person asking the question. I think self inspections are you know, if I were a plant manager, I would make sure everybody in my facility could, you know, understood product zone and understood product area. And and I'll ask the question to the group and you guys can be honest or not and type it in for Steve to read. But, you know, am I wrong when I say if there's an inspector in the lobby, what do we do What when we want to, you know, if, there, if there's a food and drug investigator in the lobby or there's an AIB inspector in the lobby, I mean, what do we do? We start cleaning. We truly start, we start start sweeping and we start cleaning and we start polishing things and and there's the, the you know I mean we need to get everybody to understand find the risk and the risk is going to be the product zone yeah well I can tell you with a lot of years of working in in the food um, uh, regulatory area uh, the, the last minute cleaning was never something that was effective in uh, reducing the uh, regulatory challenges we would find uh, so I would, there you go that's no. well said Steve well said and, and I'm sure that's the same with, with your uh, folks uh, also at AIB. But, um, well said. Yeah. Do we have any other questions out there from the audience? Um, I want to make sure we get plenty of time for all of your questions and get them answered. Um, and it looks, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions, Judy. So I'm not that's sure if okay. this means it's Friday afternoon and everyone is ready to call it a day, or if it means you did such a wonderful job that there are no questions. And I think it's probably the latter. No, it's okay. And again, I wish everybody a wonderful weekend. And thanks for joining us on this good Friday. Absolutely. And always thank you to AFTO. Well, thank you very much, Judy. Once again, a wonderful presentation on the beverage industry. And we look forward to your presentation on uh, April 12th. Uh, once again, that was uh, the link is in the chat box and all of you will receive a copy of that um, after the webinar. Thank you all very much. And we appreciate you participating together today. And thanks again to Judy and AIB International. Have a great weekend.